everybody. Welcome back to the Learn With Me stream. I've taken a whole week off and it feels like so much longer. If you're new to the stream, my name is Ashley. I work for NVIDIA. I'm a connection evangelist for Omniverse Exchange. Basically, my job is to help external developers uh, create extensions in Omniverse and get them published. And uh, I've started this Learn With Me series back in October of 2022. And I did it because I was still learning parts of Omniverse and wanted to show others how they could approach new situations and come to a conclusion by creating an extension or tools to help them out. And uh, I've done that just by showcasing it through these streams. And the great part is, is that I really, really welcome help. So if you are watching me struggle and you have an idea of how I can fix it, any suggestion I'm happy to take. I'm really good with taking feedback. I did go to art school, so I got a little bit of a thick skin and uh, happy to get that feedback and learn from it. And hopefully others can too. So yeah, that's where we're at. Now, a little bit of a recap of what we've been working on. I created this warehouse conveyor belt and I started off kind of like in a game development idea I'll make my screen a little bit bigger so um I started off with wanting to explore in game development that's what my background is in and we have the unreal connector um, and we have the early access to the Unity connector. Uh, I've kind of abandoned that project for now, and it's mo evolved more into creating different behaviors um, in Omniverse using what I, the conveyor belt and the warehouse assets. Still kind of in like a game function. Like I've created this conveyor belt with the box, and then I have like this capsule character who's my little warehouse worker. And this warehouse worker eventually is going to be able to collect the boxes from the conveyor belt and then be able to uh, add them to a pallet and the pallet's going to keep track of how many boxes are removed from the conveyor belt. And um, there's been a lot of learning with the conveyor belt, which is built in Isaac Sim. And then there was a lot of learning with creating camera constraints. Um, and Omniverse Ambassador Alberto created a camera constraint graph uh, on the live stream with Dave Tyner. And I recreated that. It worked kind of well for what I was doing, but I've decided just to use a 3D point camera constraint using Action Graph. So now when we press play, where is the little capsule? I'm like stuck somewhere, but if I switch to my, oh, that's right, I have this button issue. Anyway, so I have a, a camera connected to both the capsule and the box. So I can like watch things as they move around. And then I started creating buttons using Action Graph. And these buttons display in the viewport so that I don't have to have an external UI like I would like something like this. And um, that's kind of where we have left off, I believe. So today I'm going to be building a widget function to display um, an attribute collected from the palette and that will display in the button that I've created. But before I do any of that, I've got some housekeeping to do. As y'all know, if you've been watching these streams or you get anything from NVIDIA, our big conference GC GTC is coming up in just a couple of weeks. I'm actually a part of a ton of different things. So I wanted to share with you the different sessions that I'm a part of so that if you want to join, if you want to check these things out, you can. Now, uh, I created this little doc, but I'll share this in a second. First thing I wanted to show off this awesome curated catalog that Amelia posted in the forums. There are so many sessions and all you have to do is click this little, these little numbers here and it brings you automatically to that session. If you have an account, you log in. If you don't have an account, you make an account and you add it to your schedule. Um, these are really cool. There are so many different things. Uh, and then Amelia has been kind enough to even uh, curate it for different like creators and developers and enterprise, all that stuff. So wanted to share that. And then I want to share the ones that I'm actually a big part of. So if you like what I do, then this might be something you're interested in. First thing is um, I'm at a 
teacher assistant on this one. So I'm not actually teaching the course, but this is a DLI course that Maddie and Jen Baruski are a part of. They are going to be teaching the fundamentals of universal scene description. The thing is with these DLI courses, they are limited capacity. So if you want to do this, you add it to your schedule and then be one of the first ones in. I think there's 60 seats. So after 60 seats, the session is closed. Then another DLI course that is also limited capacity is one that I'm teaching, like me, actually me teaching this course um, with some help from Jen and uh, my team. And this is how to build custom 3D scene manipulator extensions. So you're going to be creating um, a UI, you're going to be creating a 3D scene manipulator like a slider, and then you're going to add a function to that slider. And this is a two hour session, add it to your schedule, first 60 people in get a seat, and then you follow along and you learn how to create a 3D scene manipulator and some UI stuff. So, uh, and yeah, you have to have a little bit of basic Python experience, but if you've been watching my streams, you see it's really not that hard and you can pick things up very quickly. I actually taught this at SIGGRAPH and there was a lot of, I even had a teenager in the seats at SIGGRAPH. He was 17 years old in high school and was able to build this. So it's not very difficult and it's fun to do. And last thing I'm a part of is uh, Connect with the Experts. It's in AR and VR and Omniverse. It's me, Omer, Haskell, so many different people a part of NVIDIA that are going to be taking your questions and talking about our experiences with working in Cloud XR and uh, other VR and AR applications in Omniverse. Then we're going to do breakout sessions where we take your questions. Um, if we have a demo, we can showcase a demo. And that is a 50 minute long session. Uh, it is not a limited seating. So, but you do want to. Uh, take note that it's an interactive session. So this is something that you have to be live a part of. There are some of these sessions where they're like recorded and you can watch them later. But if you add this to your schedule and you want to be a part of the live meeting, then you need to attend at that actual time. All right. Now, with all of that said, that's a ton of links. So <laughs> I just figured, oh, cool. Thank you for that. So actually, the fundamentals of the U.S., D has a hundred seats. Mine that I'm teaching only has 60. Um, so the 3D scene manipulators that has 60 seats and the USD fundamentals has a hundred seats. So that's a lot of people that are able to get in. But uh, actually, wait, that might not work. Let's, I don't know if that link works. Oh no, it does. I see people coming in. Okay, so I made a doc where it has all of those links. So I didn't spam the chat with like a ton of links. So there you go. Curated catalog, fundamentals of USD uh, that I'm a TA of, and then the one that I'm teaching, the 3D sim manipulator, and then the connect with the experts, which I'm also a part of with a bunch of other people. So there you go. All right, I think that's all my housekeeping. Let's go ahead and get into the actual scene itself. So, let me show my action graph, go into my awesome layout that I have, that I like to use, my visual scripting layout. Oh, it didn't load. Error not found. Word, that's so weird. It usually works. I must have something going wrong. I must have corrupted it or whatever. All right, we'll just use the default one. It's not too far off from the one I created. Let's open up the U viewport UI action graph and kind of just talk about it really quick. So I've created this button that starts on a stage event. When OmniGraph start play, it will set the viewport mode descripted. It places it um, at a certain position on the viewport. It is in a front to back stack. If you've built any extension, it's kind of like using a Z stack or V stack or H stack, um, just setting the way that it's placed on the viewport. And then that creates the button. And I've had it say, I'm a button. And uh, 
I did get this button to move on a on which it clicked. So when I do press it, um, it is a little bit difficult to see, but you'll see this little value will have like a very light gray check mark in it when I click the button. Very hard to see, but it's there, which it's being recognized that it's clicked. Now, I don't really want a functioning button. I don't really want my button to do anything. I'm going to have my button act as display text. So what I wanted to show today is how I can use Action Graph to grab an attribute and then display that attribute in the text of my button. However, I'm going to have to create a behavior script in order to do that. So let's go ahead and stop this for now. Oh, also, uh, this was an issue that came up a couple of times. When we set the viewport mode to scripted, you unfortunately cannot press any of these buttons. So you have to set your settings um, your rendering settings and what camera you're looking through before you press play. The only way to be able to interact with these buttons is in a default mode, but then the button does not get created. It has the only way the button gets created is in scripted mode. So it's just a little bit um, of an issue for now. It's a little difficult to read the text. Okay, I make this full screen. Probably better if I just keep myself scrolled in. I also got some great feedback from Michael M in the comments of my last stream that my bitrate was a little low. So hopefully my bitrate is better. I'm like directly plugged into my my modem. So I'm getting a lot of good feedback from people. I appreciate that. I want to make sure everything's readable and you guys can watch the stream comfortably and be able to see what I'm doing. Cool. Full screen is good. Thanks guys. Okay, so what we need to do is create an attribute and then we need to be able to read that attribute and that attribute is gonna plug into the button's text and then we need to register every time that attribute changes to change the button text on the screen. So first thing we're gonna do is let's this is going to be we're we want to collect the boxes on a palette so let's go back to our default layout and in the nvidia assets there is a bunch of palettes that we can pick from we type in palette. Let's do like, there's so many cool different ones. Let's just do like a regular recycled wood palette. It is massive. Whoa. It is way bigger than my zine. And so for one, let's put it at the world origin and then maybe like, 0 0.05 what's that look like that seems more of an appropriate size let's put that at the end of our conveyor belt probably actually a little bit smaller than that 0 0.03 Oh, you know what? I usually have music playing in the background. I was like, why does it sound so quiet? There we go. Let's do this. Let's turn down the volume. That's better. All right. So this conveyor belt's going to go here. So when a box falls on it, I guess we don't even need the capsule character at this point. Um, it will register the box by keeping track of um an integer and it's in a in its attribute so we're gonna create this attribute this wood palette if we click add and then the very first one is attribute we're gonna call this one 
reflection. And this is going to be an integer. And we'll click add. So let's look at the raw USD properties and that should pop up. There we go, right here, collection. So in our graph, let's open up that viewport UI. I'm going to take this palette and I'm gonna drag this over here and I'm going to read this attribute. And I'm going to make sure that the attribute name in my, my node is the attribute collection because that's what I'm looking for. And now that's an integer. The button text, if you can read that, I'll zoom in, it's a string. And an integer is not going to plug into a string. So if I was to take the value of this read prim attribute and plug it in, it's going to give me a, a console notification saying that it's not compatible. So what I need to do is convert that integer to a string. And that's very easy to do. I can use this little search or my favorite thing is to do press tab and just type in what I'm looking for. And I'm gonna grab the function to string. So now I can plug this value in and it's gonna convert that integer into a string. And now I can plug it into the text of my button. So when I press play, my box is really set tiny, um, but you'll see that it displays zero. So let's press stop and let's just make that box a little bit bigger. Do like, I guess 50 is too big, 25, 25, just to make the box more visible. What's that look like? Really weirdly stretched. <laughs> I need like a rectangle. Maybe a box. Okay, that, that's more visible. So now you can see the zero is in the button text. Um, the problem with this, and you know, shout out to Jen for helping me with this. I was working on a project with Matthew Schwartz from New Jersey Institute of Technology, and we were kind of creating something that um, where collisions need to be detected. And I was having such a hard time trying to figure out how to update this for every frame because it displays zero in the first frame, but it doesn't get updated every time it changed. And so I knew to use on USD change, but I couldn't get it to read the actual attribute itself. And Jen helped me out so much. So shout out to Jen, cause that was awesome. So I need to read every time the USD changes. So on USD object change, no, yes. So on USD object change, I could realistically just plug this in, but it reads every single time the uh, like palette change. So if there's collisions happening or say this was a moving object, if that was to update every single time, it's going to slow down all, oh, Jen, that's you. I didn't realize that was your screen name. No, Jen, you definitely helped out. You figured out the on switch thing, which I'm gonna show. Like, she's not giving herself enough credit. So uh, it will slow down the scene and your frame rates will just be completely terrible. Um, so it's much better to just read when that attribute of that USD object changes. And this is where Jen like came in clutch for real. So we have on switch to switch on token this is the saving grace 
this plugs in here. Let's disconnect it from the set viewport mode. And then we have to add the input and the input is going to be flexion. That's the attribute that we named. And now, oops, plug it into value and then we plug it in here. So now when I display it, I have this here. Oh, how can I show, how can I show an example of when it changes? I don't think I can actually like, oh, here we go. Oh no, see it, it changed. So if I up the integer, it changes every single time that USD object changes. For some reason, my camera is all messed up, but I'm worrying about the camera later. And yeah, there we go. So that works. But now we need a script to like change that collection every time a box hits it. So that's, that's going to be the really big part. So what does on switch on token do as far as detecting the change? That is a great question. Let's see if the node library gives us a better, oh, they changed the node library. It looks different. Let's type in switch, switch on, switch on token, click it. It outputs an execution pulse along a branch, which matches the input token. For example, if input's value is set to A, it will continue downstream from outputs if there is an inputs branch set to A as well. That is a little confusing. I don't know exactly what it does. Maybe Jen has a good explanation. She's the one who discovered it. Uh, in my head, this is what I think. It is grabbing the token from the object that matches the input that we've said to match to. So it's looking for this token. And a token is like the smallest attribute. Like it can be an integer, it can be a double, it can be a float. Um, so it's trying to match that attribute. In my head, that's what I'm thinking. Hopefully I'm correct. What's that game? Like if you, you're given like a topic and you explain that topic and then you ask at the end of it, am I close? And then someone who's like an expert tells you that's what I just did. All right. So full screen. Now that we have the function in ha functioning happening every time the USD changes, now it's time to actually like script these changes um i need to like detect when collisions are happening i guess and so if my box makes it all the way around the conveyor belt falls off the conveyor belt and collides with my palette then that's when i want to update the collection attribute jen also sent me this awesome frequently used Python snippets. I'm going to throw that in our chat as well because I'm going to try to use this today where I create a physics scene, enable the physics and coll collision for the mesh of the cube, and then um, check if my collisions are overlapping. I don't know if I'm going to get this done during this whole stream because I only have a half hour. So we're going to see how far we get. Um, yeah. Jen has given a really good explanation. For the switch on token, on USD change will spit out what property was changed and the property is a type of token. Then using switch on token, we're filtering out when to continue our execution. 
That is a great explanation. We should copy and paste that into this. <laughs> Okay, so let me copy paste this. There you go, this is, what, this is what I'm using today. Now, instead of creating a whole extension, I'm gonna use this as a behavior script. So let's go into default. Let's go into my project files. This is where I've been storing all my USD and um, I'm gonna create a scripts folder. So it's similar to if you worked in Unity or Unreal, I'm assuming as well. My background's in Unity and when you're using Unity and you're making scripts, you create a folder called scripts. It's where you store everything. And we're going to create a new Python behavior script. And we're gonna call this one detect Collision. Make sure I spell collision correctly. Now, let's open up Visual Studio Code. So when I double click it, it opens up my empty behavior script. And I've got all this stuff going on. I'm gonna minimize Omniverse for now because I won't, I'm not gonna need it just yet. And I need to be able to see, let's, throw this on the side and let's throw this on its side here make this actually a little bit bigger so in the behavior script i'm going to attach this behavior script to the palette and I need this script to detect when the cube overlaps a collision, overlaps a collider on the palette. So it's gonna take some time to figure out. Um, in the default behavior script, you are given a bunch of different classes or um, methods. So you, one class, detect collision, and then it like default a bunch of different methods. So in it, destroy, play, pause, stop, update. Yeah. Uh, overlaps the bounding box. We're gonna use physics for this. So we're gonna be adding, what's it say? you're adding like uh, a convex hole to it. So where's that at? I was looking at this before. I'm gonna make this bigger. Ooh, look how big that is. That looks really nice. Okay, you, so you're set setting a different, a, like a specific type of rigid body. And you can do different kind of collision approximations. And uh, I think this is going to be how we do it. So first thing we need to do is create a physics scene. And we need to import. Okay, so this thing. We need to import this. I guess we need to import Omni too. That didn't like default. We, we only got like from OmniKit scripting. So just to make sure I'm gonna copy what it tells me to, to have here. And then I need to add a physics scene prim to the stage. So this makes sure that it's always, there's always one there. Uh, I'm pretty sure I already have one. But we'll just, we'll do this anyway to make sure that it is added. I don't think it'll add more than one. We'll have to check. I think I would do this, like it just kind of tells us to do this in like the script editor or like a pure Python application. Um, 
So it really doesn't give an example of like how you would do that in a method. I think I would do it in my init. I thought it still kind of confuses me like what the init is. Maddie and Jen have done a great job explaining it to me in different ways, but it's still kind of confusing to me because I come from C sharp. So it's a, uh, it's, it's a little different. So, uh, self dot stage equals Omni USD get context. This I'm familiar with. I've done this a, a bunch of times and uh, get stage. And then, do I need to add a self, self.scene? No, I just, I'm just like creating, add a physics scene. So scene equals USD physics scene define stage or define. And that is stage. SDF path. I could just copy this, I guess. And set gravity. Grav create gravity direction attribute. Negative, why does it go negative one on the Z axis? My scene, I don't remember, is my scene, my scene is Z up, so I would put it downward. I guess we'll see, let's just add it and then we'll see what it does. This would be going upward. That's what Zia said. Negative one would be going in the up direction. Hmm. It's just like applying that gravitational force, like a negative one, then goes down. Just undo what I just did. I guess so it's like applying the gravity. It's like pushing it down. I don't really know. I don't understand that. Create gravity direction attribute. Set it to a vector three flow. I don't know. I'm not going to worry about that for now because I can just change it. Okay. And then... The following can be added to set specific settings. In this case, CPU physics in TGS Solver. This is using physics schema. This is grabbing the physics API and applying it to the physics scene. Um, okay, so got the physics API equals all of this. Create and enable the attribute. Hmm. Let's just add it. <laughs> let's just let's just go for it. And we'll also add this to our init. Make sure everything's tabbed correctly. Oh, I got to make sure I import the physics schema. I'm just probably out of here. I don't need multiple from PXRs. Physics schema. Oh, we should make sure that our physics is even enabled. In code, it's not, I think. So. In extensions, if you type in physx, it is 
this like whole extension, all these core, like the physics core and all these different things. I think in, in code, it's like automatically disabled, but for Cree, it is enabled. So I don't have to worry about it. It's all here. Core is enabled. Okay. So I don't have to worry about it. We're good. Let's minimize that again. Okay. So we got all this going on. Adding in a ground plane to stage. Oh, I don't need to do that. But if you are want to do that using code, then there you go. You can just add it with this physics schema tools dot add ground plane and then all these. I don't need to do that because I already have one and that'll just be default in the stage. And then this one is enable a physics and collision for a mesh. So create a cube mesh it grabs the stage and then it uses a command to execute uh which creates that push mesh prim command creating a cube i don't need to do that because i will be using packages from the nvidia assets and then it's going to grab the prim um so we'll need to change that path and then it's going to enable physics on that prim using utils dot set rigid body grabbing that prim path setting the rigid body to a convex hull and then right now it will be set to false maybe we should yeah, we'll use the prim path for the cube as like already going around the conveyor belt. So we should, this should be on play. On play, it will add, it will set that rigid body. So we'll do this here. Um, and it's going to be, I guess we can set the, and in, in the end, it will define the cube path. We'll just use the same variable they did. And I don't know. Let me make sure my path is the same. What is? Oh, it's self dot stage. Go to. You just did this five minutes ago using commands to tell you how? Oh, like, you mean like creating the, the cube? Yeah. So like if you follow that uh, extension video that Paul Kutzinger does where it's like um, how to create your first extension in five and 10 minutes, you use the command properties to create, a, to execute a cube in your scene. You can add a button to make it do that. It's really, it's really fun. So basically we're going to, we don't need to do that because I'm going to be using packages, but for the sake of right now and getting this done, cause we can always change it later. We're going to use, where's my cube? There we go. Oh, it's the same thing. So it's going to be world slash world slash cube. That's my prim path right there. So get prim at path world slash cube Oops. okay so then oh we need to do that on play so we're gonna do the self dot cube prim equals oh no we don't need that it's gonna be Utils uh, set rigid body of self dot cube prim and turn it into a convex all and it says false. Did it have to be self dot utils? Yep. Okay, so. On play, setting the rigid body of our cube that already exists in the scene, so we don't need to create it. And 
if a tighter collision approximation is desired, can use con convex decomposition. That's a fun name. Let's skip that. To verify collision meshes have been successfully enabled, click the eye icon, show by type, physics mesh, all. This will show the collision meshes as pink outlines on the object. Okay, so let's pause here. Let's uh, save this. Let's go into here. So now we can click on our palette and we're gonna add a Python script to it. So add just like we did with the attribute. Now we're gonna click on Python scripting. And where is it? Here, so add asset, go into my scripts, grab my detect collision. And let's do that thing it told us to do. Show physics, show, let's do all, whoa. Oh cool, look, the conveyor belt has the uh, rigid body collision meshes on it. Where is my, let's find my cube. Let's switch to my cube camera. So when we are, oh, where is it? Where's my cube at? Oh, do that little trick that we were told about. The reset. Cube, where are you? On the floor. That's weird. Let's just press play. Why is my cube camera messed up? Let's pause. Let's go into just regular camera. Okay. I'm gonna have to fix my cameras. I must have messed them up when I was like messing in the scene or something. Okay, let's press play now. So right now there's no pink on it. Mm, no pink on it still, so it didn't add, it didn't do it. Oh look, it got rid of my, what happened? That was weird. I just like control Z and, and it came back. Okay. I, I saved. Control S, I saved. Make sure my palette has the script on it. Yep. Click my cube. It doesn't have any pink on it right now, like everything else. Press play. It did not add it. Okay, let's go back. It got rid of it. Oh no, it's still there. No, I thought I got rid of it again. I was gonna say, what? Oh wait, maybe it has to be true. Why is it false? False would mean that it's not turned on, right? I mm, won't try true. Did I save that? Yep. Okay. Now let's press play. No. Okay, let's see. Result path. Create a cube mesh in the stage. I, I skipped that because I have a cube on the stage. Get the prim. Uh, the prim, that is the, I don't know, maybe I need to change I don't know why the quotations would make that big of a difference, but maybe it does. And then... Utils set rigid body. The cube prim add the convex hull. It says false. Let's maybe turn it back to false. 
just to, you know, keep consistent with what this tells us to do. Go back in here. I changed the quotation. That's all I did. Let's see if that, you know, made a difference. No, it didn't. Hmm. Let's go back. This doesn't make sense to me why it's false. I would assume that if we're turning it on, it has to be true. And play. Mm -mm. I mean, I have physics material in my scene. Rigid body enabled. Would that be the collider? Oh, oh, it's there. Look, see, collision enabled. Approximation is the convex hull. I don't know why it's not showing pink then. Physics material. Do we need to do that? I mean, it doesn't change the color or anything, but it does have a collider on it. That's a convex hull. What are the other options? A bounding sphere or a bounding cube. Triangle mesh. What's a convex hull? What if I change it to bounding cube? The belt is not the structure. That's why it's not pink. Oh, no, I'm not looking at the belt. That's a good. Yeah, sorry. I'm looking at the box. According to the documentation, it says that to verify a collision mesh has been successfully enabled, you click the eye icon, show type of meshes, physics mesh all, and it'll show that the collision meshes are pink outlines on the objects, which does show it on the on here these are they have collision meshes but it doesn't show it on my box but it does have a collision mesh on it i changed it to bounding cube let's see if that you know makes a difference i don't know it doesn't i don't know it's on it though so how's a collider So I just want this collider and the collider of my, this doesn't even have a collider on it. So I need to add a collider to my palette. And then when those colliders touch each other, it updates the collection saying, okay, there's been one contact. And then if another box falls in it, then two contacts. No, the palette does not have pink also because there is not a collider on it. See, there's no pink. If I add a collider, though. Physics. Does it need to have a rigid body? I guess so. I don't see pink on this either. I did show all show by type physics. I don't care to see the joints. Colliders, I said all. Attachments, nope. Meshes. Oh, whoopsies, did not mean to do that. Oh man, it's 153 already. That went by fast. Okay, well, I've got a collider on it. it it's there. Let's continue on. Set mass properties for a mesh. So basically do all this again. And then mass API. I'm gonna skip that for now. If I need it later, I'll come back to it. Traverse a stage and assign collision meshes to all children. I don't need to do that. 
I just have one cube for now. Do an overlap test. This is what I this is what I'm trying to get at. So check overlap box defines the cubic region to check overlap with. So carb carb float three. That's the extent of the cubic region. The origin, the rotation, a physics query to detect number of hits for a cubic region. Number of hits equals this. And the overlap box. The report hit, which is here. Defaults to false. Number of hits. Why is that? Physics query to detect number of hits for a spherical reason. Oh, so if this was a sphere, gotcha. Okay. I was like, why is that commented out? Because it's for a sphere. Okay. And then it updates. Well, I would want it to update the attribute. So I would set. I would set the attributes, but I can come back to that. This, and then this has it, when it reports a hit, it changes the color of the object. I guess that's okay for now, just to test it and make sure it works. So on play, it sets it to Oh, you know what? We can see if this works because I set it to a bounding box. Um, now when I press play, it should put it back to a convex hull. This will be the good way we can test. So cube, let's scroll down to um, the approximation. It should change to convex hull if the script is working properly. Nope. It didn't. Okay, so that's a problem. Oh, you know what? Probably I'm not. I'm not defining play anywhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying like do this, uh, right? So like I would say self on play, right? Yeah, I think so. Now we can press play. No, it didn't do it. I'm missing something. My cube has a mesh. I added it. Hmm. Yeah, good point, data juggler. Computers do what you tell them not to be confused with what you want. I know, I'm trying to figure out what I'm missing to tell it what to do. I'm calling... I don't know. I tell it to do this and this happens when play is called. I'm not sure, I'm a little lost. All right, I think I gotta start wrapping things up. So um, on Wednesday, I have to have a little bit of a shorter stream because I've got to do some GTC stuff. You guys saw all of the sessions I'm on. So I have some GTC dry runs I got to do. So I'm going to put a pause on this detect collision thing. Uh, maybe I'll do a little work behind the scenes and see if I can get it figured out so that 
Monday of next week, I'll have a little bit more of a clear understanding of the documentation, what the documentation is telling me what to do and um, how that can be applied in a behavior script. And then we can get it working. But on Wednesday, I'm going to show how to create an action graph node, a custom action graph node. Um, so in my action graph, you know, I have all these preset nodes that are created by the OmniGraph node team, but you can create your own and have it do your own stuff. So I'll show you guys how to do that because I learned how to do that pretty recently. I thought that was really cool. It's quick to do. And um, that stream is only going to be a half hour on Wednesday. And then I'll return on Monday back in this stuff. So don't forget to sign up for GTC and look at all the cool sessions that I showed earlier and um, check out the Google Docs. I will put this in the, doc in the chat again if you missed it so that y'all can join the ones that I'm a part of and check out the catalog that Amelia has been so awesome to curate for us. All right, everybody. I'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks for watching. Bye, everybody.